I've just had a private meeting with some of the families of the British dead, as well as with war veterans and Iraqis who have lost family members as a result of the war, as I have continued to do over the past dozen years. It was right that the inquiry heard evidence from such a wide range of people and that the origins, conduct and aftermath of the war should have been examined in such detail. But the extraordinary length of time it has taken to see the light of day is clearly a matter for deep regret and has weakened its capacity to hold those responsible to account. There is no doubt that the decision to invade and occupy Iraq in March 2003 was the most significant foreign policy decision taken by a British government in modern times. It divided Parliament and set the government of the day against a majority of the British people, as well as against the weight of global opinion. The war was not in any way, as Sir John Chilcott says, a last resort. It was an act of military aggression launched on a false pretext as the inquiry accepts and has long been regarded as illegal by the overwhelming weight of international legal opinion. It led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq and the displacement of millions of refugees. It devastated Iraq's infrastructure and society. The US-British occupation led to a lethal sectarianism that turned into a civil war. <coughs> Instead of protecting security at home or abroad, the war fueled and spread terrorism across the region, including in the countries that launched it. Sunday's suicide bomb attack in Baghdad, which killed over 250 people, the deadliest so far, was carried out by a group whose origins lie in the aftermath of the invasion. By any measure, the invasion and occupation of Iraq was a catastrophe. The decision to invade in 2003 on the basis of what the Chilcot report calls flawed intelligence about weapons of mass destruction has had a far-reaching impact on us all. It's also led to a fundamental breakdown in trust in politics and our institutions of government. The tragedy is that while the government class got it so horrifically wrong, the majority of our people called it right. On February the 15th, 2003, along with one and a half million people spanning the entire political spectrum in Britain and tens of millions of others across the world, many of us marched against the impending war in the biggest ever demonstration in the history of this country. It wasn't, absolutely wasn't, that we underestimated the brutality or crimes of the Saddam Hussein dictatorship. Many of us had campaigned against the Iraqi regime during its most bloody period, when the British government and the US administration were busy supporting and arming it as the 1996 Scott Inquiry demonstrated. We were not apologists for Saddam Hussein in any way whatsoever. We could see that this state, broken by sanctions and war, posed no military threat. That the weapons of mass destruction evidence was flimsy and confected. That going to war without United Nations authorization was profoundly dangerous. That foreign invasion and occupation would be resisted by force and that it could set off a series of uncontrollable and destructive events. If only the majority of our members of parliament had listened to the wisdom of our own people when they voted on the 18th of March 2003 against waiting for the United Nations authorization through a second resolution, the course of events might have been very, very different. There are a large number of members in parliament today including dozens of my Labour colleagues who voted to stop the Iraq war. But none of us will take any satisfaction from this report. Instead, all of us will feel saddened by what has been revealed and what we must now reflect on. The report has dug deep into the, many, into the litany of failures of planning for the occupation, 
the calamitous decisions to stand down the Iraqi army and to dissolve the entire Iraqi state. But the reality is, it was the original decision to follow the United States president into an unprovoked war in the most volatile region in the world and impose a colonial style occupation that led to every further disaster. The government's September 2002 dossier with its uh, false claim that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction that could be deployed in 45 minutes was only the most notorious of those many deceptions. Major General Michael Lorry told the inquiry, and I quote, we knew at the time that the purpose of the dossier was precisely to make a case for war rather than setting out the available intelligence. It goes without saying that never again should intelligence be fixed around policy instead of fixing policy around intelligence and legality. Military action in Iraq not only turned a humanitarian crisis into a humanitarian disaster, it also convulsed the entire Middle East region and beyond. Just as military intervention for regime change in Libya in 2011 left the country in the grip of warring militias and terror groups. And the Iraq war increased the threat of terrorism to our own country. Baroness Manning and Buller, former head of MI5, made this very clear to the inquiry. I invite people to read her evidence. There are many lessons that need to be drawn from the Iraq war and the inst investigation carried out by Sir John Chilcott for our country, government and parliament, as well as for my own party, the Labour Party. They include the need for a more open and independent relationship with the United States, particularly as we face the prospects of a new and potentially much more hawkish presidency, and for a foreign policy based on upholding international law and the authority of the United Nations, which seeks peaceful solutions to all international disputes. We also need much stronger oversight of the security and intelligence services, full restoration of proper cabinet government, and to give Parliament the decisive say over the fut any future decision to go to war, based on objective information, not through government discretion, but through a War Powers Act which I hope will be passed rapidly in the British Parliament. Finally, we need Britain to join the 30 other countries, including Germany and Spain, that already support giving the International Criminal Court the power to prosecute those responsible for the crime of military aggression. There are no more important decisions a Member of Parliament ever gets asked to make than those relating to war and peace. The very least that MPs and the country should be able to expect is rigorous and objective evidence on which to base their decisions. We now know that Parliament was misled in the run-up to the war, and MPs should now decide how it should deal with that 13 years later, just as all those who took the decision laid bare in the Chilcot report must face up to the consequences, whatever they may be. As I said earlier, I've just been meeting a group of families, military servicemen and women who lost their loved ones, Iraq war veterans and Iraqi citizens who lost relatives as a result of that war that the US and British governments launched. I apologize to them for the decisions taken by our then government that led the country into a disastrous war. It was a disaster that occurred when we were in government. 140 of my then colleagues opposed it at the time, as did many, many, many members of my party, of trade unions, and of many other organizations in this country. Many more have since said they regret their vote. My fellow MPs who voted for the war in 2003 did so on the basis of loyalty to the government and information and intelligence, which the Chilcot report has been confirmed to have been false. They were misled by a small number of leading figures who were committed to joining the United States invasion of Iraq come what may and were none too scrupulous about how they made the case for the war. Politicians and political parties 
can only grow stronger by acknowledging when they get it wrong and by facing up to their mistakes. So I now apologise sincerely on behalf of my party for the disastrous decision to go to war in Iraq. The apology is owed first to all the people of Iraq. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost and the country is still living with the devastating consequence of the war and the forces it unleashed. They have paid the greatest price for the most serious foreign policy calamity of the last 60 years. The apology is also owed to the families of those soldiers who died in Iraq or have returned home injured and incapacitated. They did their duty, but it was in a conflict they should never have been sent to. Finally, it's an apology to the millions of British citizens who feel our democracy was traduced and undermined by the way in which the decision to go to war was taken on the basis of a secret, I will be with you, whatever. Understandings given to the US president that have been now publicly exposed by Sir John Chilcott's report published this morning. Our society has also suffered consequences. Community relations have been compromised and damaged. Civil liberties have been undermined and a menace of terrorism has grown as a result. Our party has learned the lessons. One of the three main pillars of my election as leader of the party last year was for a different kind of foreign policy. To uphold international law, to seek peaceful solutions to international disputes, to respect the role and the authority of the United Nations, and always to treat war as absolutely the last resort. The decision to go to war in Iraq has been a stain on our party and our country but we now have the chance to work together to build more constructive and mutually balanced relationships with the rest of the world based on cooperation, peace and international justice. Thank you very much. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn there apologising on behalf of his party over the decision to go to war in Iraq in 2003. He said it was the most calamitous foreign policy decision made by this country in the last 60 years and he said it had left a stain on his party and on the country.